One, two, three. Hallelujah! Clap for the Lord. Amen. Let's all be seated in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Look at your neighbor and say, get your Bible out. Okay, so this is a Bible church. Listen now, let me tell you this. I know that technology is, is great. And so I don't care which Bible you use. If it's your phone, if it's your iPad, just get you one. Amen. And so that you can follow along. Now, we've advanced so much with this technology that sometimes we come with different versions of the Bible. And so that's where sometimes it's helpful to uh, know how to navigate through that Bible app. Amen. Come on. Most of our people around here are aware of the Bible app. Um, there's a few different ones, but uh, most of them got different versions of the Bible. Now, why is it necessary to do all of this? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. See, the world tells you what you don't know won't hurt you. But that's a lie. What you don't know will kill you. Amen. And so you got to be educated. You got to be trained up in the ways of God. And a lot of people say God said this. God said that. But what you need to be able to say is, well, where is that in the book? Because that's what you said, he said, but you need to bring me to some scripture so I can verify. Come on. <laughs> I'm going to need to verify that what you're saying is true. And that's why we always spend so much time in the Bible. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So um, let me go ahead and pray and we'll get right into what God has for us today. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for blessing us, blessing us to be here this morning. We thank you for giving us yet another opportunity to sit at your feet and to receive fresh rhema from heaven. I bind the work of the devil right now in the name of Jesus, that there be no distractions, but that your word would go forth and accomplish that which you've sent it to. We thank you, Lord, and we surrender to the power of the Holy Ghost now in Jesus name. Amen. amen. Church said amen. Praise God. All right. So we've been preaching this series entitled Living Better. Man, I, I cannot emphasize this enough. Jesus never, look at your neighbor say never. never. Listen, you could search it all through the scriptures. He never left people the same way he found them. Amen. He never, listen, everybody that allowed him to come in got changed. You see what I'm saying? The people that the world would throw away. Jesus came over there and touched them and their lives were forever changed. See, that's what he did to me. Amen. That's what I believe he has done to anybody who is a true follower of Christ. But you got to let him in in order for him to touch you. Now, there were those that rejected him. And there were those that tried to play like they had him. Come on, somebody. They tried to play like many are doing that in the church. They trying to play like they have Jesus, but they ain't never been touched by him. And that's why they're not changed. You got to be touched by him for his power to get a hold of you and your life will change and you will live better. Now, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, well, don't you know, don't preach too much about life getting better for people because, you know, you don't want to set up a. Uh, uh, unfair expectations, you know, because you're talking about life's going to get better for people. But, you know, we struggle as Christians, man. You know, the struggle is real. And there's a lot of preaching on the struggle is real. But I'm just going to preach the book and you make your own assessment of what this is talking about. Because a lot of times people struggle because they're disobedient. Amen. A lot of people's problems are coming from their decisions and not his decision. And so when you learn to submit your life to the perfect will of God, not permissive, God will allow you to do all kind of stuff. You say, well, God didn't tell me not to, or he didn't shut the door. Let me I just push it. You can go push the door on a strip club and it'll go open for you. You can push it and it'll go. And then matter of fact, there'll be somebody saying, come on in. And you're going to think, well, I, God never he didn't lock the door. So I guess I please come on. He will let you do whatever you want. But you don't want to live in the permissive will. You want to live in the perfect will. Some people are talking about. God, take this desire away from me. And God is saying, step up to my power and put that down. 
Because the blood is powerful enough to break that addiction. But you got willpower. And so you need to, with your own power that you have, say, I give it to you, Lord. And now his power will come alive. And so Matthew, let's go to Matthew. Remember, it's about living better because now you got Christ. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. We'll look at verse 28 through 30. He says, come unto me. What does he say? Okay, so a lot of times you want to force people. Well, you better go to church. You better do this. That ain't what Jesus is looking for. He's looking for a free will. He's looking for somebody that says, I'm going to Jesus. Oh, come on. Some of y'all need to understand where we are. Some of y'all need to say, I'm going even if you don't go. Oh, come on, y'all. See, I'm, I'm going. If, even if you don't go, I'm going. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. That's what's in this world. Labor, heavy weights. We're going to break this down. But he says, come unto me. And then what's he going to do? I'm going to give you rest. Would you rather get your own rest or would you rather get the rest he'll give you? So you can get your own rest when you decide, OK, I carried the weight long enough. Let me just lay it down for the night. But if you get the rest that comes from Jesus, the things that's supposed to hurt you and suppress you, they won't even stick on you because his power is too great. And so he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. So what he's and we're going to talk about this yoke in a minute. But a yoke is what you would put around an ox's neck to keep them in line or keep them connected or attached. Well, God wants you to take his yoke and be yoked up with him. How I many know you, you need to be yoked with Jesus. So even when you try to get away, your neck gets stuck. Come on. Some of y'all say, I need a bigger yoke. I need, that's what it is. I need to ask Jesus for a bigger yoke, because as soon as you try to veer, you can yank back. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now, when you're yoked with him, you can learn about him. Well, you could say a lot of people say I'm a Christian, but they don't even know how Jesus acts. Say I'm a Christian, but wait, what does that mean? It means to be Christ like. Well, man, I better learn what Christ does. Well, how can I learn what he does if I'm so far away from him? Come on, somebody. How am I going to learn what Jesus does if I only meet up with him on Sundays? Can I get amen up in here? How am I going to learn what he does and how he lives if I don't even let him in my personal business? How many know when you get saved, you have no more personal business? Come on. It's all his business. Amen. It ain't your business no more. It ain't meant to be kept private. You're supposed to take it to him. And so he says, and learn, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Now, this is the way Jesus is. He's not prideful or boastful. A lot of people are prideful and boastful. Now, here's what happens. There is something called a holy boldness that comes upon you. And now people that are not living for God, they will call that pride. And they've done that to me. They've tried to say that I'm prideful. No, no, it's holy boldness. Yes, it's a fire and the heat's too hot. Yes, That's why you can't stand to get too close to me because it's a holy boldness. Amen. Yes, now, if it was up to me, I would back up off of it. But it ain't me. It's the Holy Ghost fire. I can't get out of this fire. It's been burning and it ain't going to stop burning. And so guess what? I might offend you. I might get under your skin. But understand, it ain't the power of me. It's greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So people don't be confused with pride and holy boldness. See, holy boldness will have you standing strong for Jesus. Pride will have you standing strong based on yourself. Pride will have you talking about what you can do. Holy boldness will have you talking about what he can do through you. Amen. And that's the difference. And when people really got them, they don't have this uh, weak, timid, uh, sissified Christianity. Come on. They don't have that. See, when people just weak, sissified, oh, broke down, busted and disgusted, that's just pride in disguise. But when God says, rise up, walk with your head held high, that's the anointing. And because he's going to do that through you. Amen. And so and this is why he says, Learn of me. I am meek and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Next verse. For my yoke. What? Easy. 
it's a lot easier, man. I've been trying to tell people this for years. It's a lot easier to just be connected to Jesus. Because when you try to do it on your own, nothing but heartache, nothing but sorrow. But he says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, this scripture starts out with come unto me. Well, how many know this requires humility? You know, prideful people don't cry for help. You know what I'm saying? They be, you know what I'm saying? Be, you'd be out of money. Don't have any food. Somebody talking about you need some. Oh, no, no, we good. You're not good. You need some help, man. And so what happens is people are too prideful to get help. But Jesus says, come unto me. Now, the thing about Jesus, he already knows you need help. But you know what is required is humility. So it's going to take humility for you to go to God in prayer and say, God, I can't do this. Oh, come on, y'all. It's going to take humility for you to just cry out to God and say, I need your help. I'm not going to make it if you don't help me. See, you're showing yourself as a dependent. But this world is set up for you to pretend like you're independent, pretend like you got it together. Amen. And so if you can understand, this requires humility. Now, I want to tell you something that I, I pray that you remember. You got to lay down before you can rise up. Come on. You got to lay down before you can rise up. A lot of people can't rise up because they never laid down. They never came to the end of themselves. Go to First Peter. First Peter five. We'll look at six and seven in the Amplified Classic. First Peter five, six and seven. He says, therefore, humble yourselves. Y'all y'all ready for this? Demote. Wait, what? Demote, lower yourselves in your own estimation. And so some people are too high, but they're too high in their own estimation. He says, demote, lower yourselves in your own estimation under the mighty hand of God. Now, just so you understand, this is not that uh, false, hum uh, the false humility that comes through religion where people are. Well, I'm not worthy. I don't know why God picked me. I don't know. That's fake. That ain't real. Amen. That's that's fake. That's false humility. Oh, I just oh, you know, you, you can't even take a compliment. Somebody tries to give you a compliment and looking at your outfit. Oh, that's not. Oh, this old thing. Come on, somebody. You know, you'd be upset if we went up to you and said, man, that is ugly. I just want you to know today it seemed like you had that in 1975. You will feel terrible. Amen. So that's false humility. Right. And so. But if you lower yourself, then that's how God lifts you up. Remember, you got to you can't rise up until you lay down. And so he says, demote yourselves, lower yourselves in your own estimation under what? The mighty hand of God. False humility is under the mighty hand of man. That's religion, right? Oh, religion. I have to take a vow of poverty. I have to look. You know what I'm saying? Some church folks be trying to look like, well, I don't want to. You know, be too flashy because I don't want to think, you know, pastors say I don't want to wear none too nice because I don't want the people to think I'm still in the money. They probably already think that about you. Yeah. Amen. And it really doesn't matter what other people think. But what matters is where is your heart when it comes to God? Wow. And so you lower yourself in your own estimation under the mighty hand of God. So I'm not. Oh, come on, somebody. I'm not humbling myself under you. Yeah. Oh, y'all, you need to get this. I'm not humbling myself under you. I try to teach my leaders. You got to lead unapologetically. So what does that mean? You got to lead unapologetically. Don't be explaining people. Don't explain something. If I've given you authority, walk in it. Come on, somebody. Make some decisions. Walk in it and don't be apologizing for it. Because we're operating under the authority of God. When you're operating under the authority of man, you always trying to please people. You try to tell them to do something and then you worried about the way you said it. What well, did I say? It be? I'm sorry. We don't have time for that. Now, if you don't know what you're doing, get out the way. Oh, come on. Y'all. Y'all don't want me to. If you don't know what you're doing, get out the way. But if you know what you're doing and you've been given authorization, then walk in it. And that's what Jesus is telling us. You know, if I lower myself under the mighty hand of God. Now. In due time, look at this. He says, in due time, he will exalt you. So remember, you got to 
lay down before you can rise up. Well, God's going to exalt me in due time, but I've got to humble myself underneath him. Now, verse seven, this is important. This is where people pass. I'm just trying to make it, trying to get, I've been telling people for years, quit trying. Man, oh, this is a rough season. Well, give it to God. Quit trying, man. It ain't going to get no better with your own power. He says, casting the whole of your care. Y'all see this? All of your cares. He says, all of your anxieties. Come on. We got to deal with this. Too many people battling anxiety and depression in the church. But what does he say about this? Casting the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries. all Y'all see that word all? What does that mean? Does that mean I can give God my money problems, but keep my worries over my kids? Keep those to me. Come on. Does it mean I can give God my uh, kids, but then keep my health worries to myself? No, it's all. He says all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns. What's it say? Once and for all. You, do you guys understand what sacrifice means? So when they sacrificed an animal, I mean, know oh, they could not go back and get it. Why? Because it got burned and it was no longer there. And so what people are doing in the modern day church is they give something to God on Sunday and then they go back and pick it up on Tuesday. Come on. That is not an offering. You've not sacrificed that to God. And so that's why we have a cycle. We have a cycle and deliverance is delayed. And so a person can be touched by the power of God, the Holy Spirit move upon them and they can feel weights of bondage fall off. And then now they can be free. But then by Tuesday, they pick it back up. And so guess what? Now they're going to struggle all the way. And then they can't wait to get back here next Sunday. But when you get back here next Sunday, you're in the same place you were last Sunday. But you were supposed to be in the next level. But come on, somebody. You were supposed to get that lifted off. Then you were so supposed to start walking higher. So that by the time you get here next Sunday, you're on another level. We don't need to keep starting over. Man, this is wasting time. We keep in the church. We keep starting over. It's like, man, you're battling the same stuff you was battling five years ago. Come on now. Well, Pastor, that's just because, you know, you're insensitive. I mean, at some point, like what if you put in your GPS? I'm going to L.A. And what if you never got there? <laughs> I mean, at some point, would you say something is wrong with this GPS? I'm going to need, listen, every single time you try to get to L.A., you end up in Tijuana. <laughs> At some point, are you going to be like, this ain't working? Yeah. Right. You, you in with me? At some point. And so what I want you to do is I want you to be able to make progress. Yes. I want you to be able to get stronger. I want you to, listen, God didn't do all this stuff for me overnight. But it's little by little. Little by little. But I made a decision as to what direction I'm going. And so what you have to do is you have to. We used to say this when I was a sales manager. I used to tell my agents, you got to burn the bridge down. And so if you burn the bridge down, you can't go back. See, some of y'all need to burn the bridge down to the hood. Come on, somebody. Some of y'all still got the hood in your GPS. You got to get rid of that because, you know, sometimes that GPS will direct you where it thinks you might want to go. And so that hood will pop up and you like find yourself. You need to burn that bridge. You need to burn that bridge. Sometimes there's casualties. You know, fire burns stuff. Sometimes, come on somebody. Sometimes when the bridge gets cut off, your access to certain people is cut off as well. Oh, y'all don't want me. I'm trying to go where Jesus is trying to take you. You know what I'm saying? Jesus basically said, if you ain't ready to leave everybody, your mama, your daddy, all of them, you're not fit for the kingdom. So, man, that's pretty aggressive, Jesus. But this is this is all or nothing, man. And so what this means is, listen, if you ain't winning them to the kingdom, they winning you to the kingdom of darkness. 
So it's all about evangelism. The devil got evangelists and God's got evangelists. And so if you're not winning them to Jesus, they are winning you to Satan. And so you got to acknowledge that quickly and say, oh, no, no. You're not about to win me over because I already left that country and I don't want to go back. Amen. But if you understand the seriousness of it. So now if I'm casting everything, so that means. I don't have the right. You know what I'm saying? I don't have the right to keep my problems to myself. Because Jesus went to that cross. And conquer sin and death so that I would not keep all my problems to myself. He says, cast them all, everything, every concern, all that type of stuff once and for all. Don't keep going and pick it up. Let it burn once and for all. And then so what does it say? Cast it on him. Not on yourself, not on your relatives, on him. Why? For he cares for you. And cares about you. Y'all in here with me? Watchfully. You know, it's an, it takes an anointing to care about somebody watchfully. See, some of your loved ones, they can care about you, but they can't care about you watchfully because they ain't watching over you. Because they don't know everything you're doing. Amen. When your kids are little, you can care about them watchfully. And so we think, you know, we got technology and we can try to work it out and have some of that stuff where you can find out where your kid is based on a cell phone. But how many know they can leave the cell phone over here and then go ahead and go over there? Amen. And so you know what a cell phone is, but you don't really know where they are. And see, with God, he sees everything. He sees you. And so he can care about you watchfully. And so he can care about you. He loves you. And affectionately, but he can care about you watchfully. And so he can watch you and watch over you no matter where you are. Amen. Go to Psalm 55, 22. Psalm 55, 22. So here it is again. Cast. That word cast means throw. Throw your burden on the Lord. Now, y'all ready for this? Releasing the weight of it. Now, let's 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 stop right here for a minute. So what do we have most of the time? People going through stuff. And what do we do as pastors? I'm sure I'm guilty of it, too. We let everybody know we all go through stuff. Oh, man, ain't nobody perfect. We all got struggles. But what's the word say? The word says cast your burden on the Lord and then what? Releasing the weight of it. So if I'm carrying the weight of my problem, I have not released the weight of it to him. But he doesn't ask me as a suggestion. He tells me, according to the word, that I am supposed to cast my burden on him and then releasing the weight of it. Now, the weight that's on me is not supposed to be on me. It's supposed to be released. And you ought to be doing this quick. Some comes at you. Pray. Amen. Come on. Some they try to come at you at the job place. Oh, excuse me. And go in there and pray. Why? Because you got to get that off you, man. You got to get that pressure. You got to get that. They can put a timeline on. You. We need you to do this and blah, 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 blah. We need all this stuff. Looks like I need the anointing. Let me go in here and pray. And you got to quickly release that off of you. Because if you release the weight of it, then he will sustain you. Amen. He will sustain you. See, there's consistency in the body of Christ. But it's consistency through Christ. What I found is that people who try to be consistent in the Lord, but they don't understand it's the Lord that has to do it all. Then now what do they become inconsistent? See, I'm not consistent in the things of the Lord because of me. I'm consistent in the things of the Lord because of him. The one decision I made was to cast it all over to him. And let him. Work it out. And so you release the weight of it, all of the, the weight of those problems, and he will sustain you. He will never allow. Look at this. What's that word? Consistently. Back it up. He will never allow the consistently righteous to be moved, made to slip, fall or fail. Stop right here. Made to. So what does that mean? See, people think that the devil can make them do something. The devil can't make you do nothing. Are you aware of this? 
The devil cannot make you drink, smoke, fight, fornicate. He can't make you do nothing. All of his power to make you do stuff was stripped. By the blood of Jesus. If you fall into those things, that's on you. That ain't on the devil. I, I need to cast out that devil. No, no, you need to cast out your flesh. You need to go in the mirror and ca I cast you out. <laughs> Amen? Amen? I'm serious. That's, this is what this is about. And so you can't be made to slip, fall, or fail, but it's the consistently righteous. Well, that's where people struggle. But we're all sinners saved by grace. No, we were sinners. We might make a mistake, but we don't stay in that mistake. Come on, somebody. I'm not moving back to Egypt, amen, just because the devil tried to make me mad at somebody. That's not my address. And so I'm not going to act like that. And so what do you do? You use a word called repentance, a word they want to pull out of the church. No, you still got to repent. Like I said, for years, if you mess up, fess up, get blessed up, let's go. Well, that don't even leave you no time to feel all bad and doom and gloom. You can't feel doom and gloom because you already fessed it up. And now God's already blessed you. He already cleaned you and said, come on, let's go. He said, where are we going, Lord? You, the same, I got the same spot, the same seat you were sitting in, I, it's still there. Sit down, let's go. And you'd be thinking like, Wow. Seems like the, the world, they would have gave me a, some type of punishment. I don't have no suspension, Jesus, no suspension or nothing. Uh-uh. Just fess it up. Get clean by the power of God. But now if you don't, you live in, in the power of yourself. And so you're going to stay with those mistakes and, and then people feel condemned. Then what do they do? Start pulling away from the things of God. You know what I'm saying? I know, I know how this works. People, they messed up, so they don't take my phone call. So I see what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You're feeling condemned. You're trying to hide under that tree. I'm about to bring an ax over your house. I'm going to cut that tree down. We, don't, we can't play games with this. Now, what does this mean? You might mess up, but listen, with the Holy Ghost living on the inside of you, you're going to do right more than you're going to do wrong. I guarantee you that. You ain't going to keep doing wrong because the Holy Ghost is too strong. You might mess up here and there, but that ain't going to be no lifestyle for you no more. You see what I mean? Because it's the power of God. But you've got to humble yourself. You've got to submit yourself to his power. And so as we see, the word is telling us to release the weight of it. So the weight, what? The weight of the problems that come. Do you understand that our shoulders are not designed to carry the weight of this world? They are designed to carry the weight of his glory. Oh, see, y'all. I'm over here giving y'all some advanced. I'm giving y'all some advanced teaching, man. Our shoulders are not designed to carry the weight of this world. Our shoulders are designed to carry the weight of his glory. And so. Let's go over to Isaiah, Isaiah 60, verses 1 and 2, King James. He says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Next verse. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon who? You. The world is going to see the glory of God on us. Let's look at this uh, Isaiah 60 verse 1 in the Amplified Classic. Arise from what? Okay. Arise from depression and prostration that in which the circumstances have kept you. Rise to new life. Shine. Be radiant with the glory of the Lord, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And so if we're looking this, at this, he says, I want us to look at, let's back it up. He says, arise from depression. We've got to deal with this. And prostration. So this prostration means extreme 
mental or emotional depression or deject dejection. See, that leads to hopelessness. And so he says, rise up. Well, how do we do this? Because it's like, wait, pastor, I'm, this thing is, is heavy on me. When we talk about releasing it, remember, cast all the care. So you've got to lose all confidence in your own ability. You've got to realize if he don't do it, I ain't going to make it. But see, if you put God to that type of challenge, oh, he going to do it. Oh, he going to do it. Because he doesn't know how to fail. Amen. Come on, somebody. He doesn't know how to not fix your problem. But the, the deal is the enemy is trying to get you to keep it, contain it, let it weigh you down. Let it cause that depression to come upon you. And now what do they do? They want everybody to be sensitive to depression. And I, I start preaching like this, then it, it causes offense because people say, well, but I'm depressed, Pastor. I know that. That's why this message came out. Come on, somebody, because you don't need to be in a situation where you are numb to the situation. And now when the medication runs off, you back in it. How many of y'all want to go free? God has come to set the captives free. We're supposed to be walking around here with deliverance. God gave us a plan of deliverance, not a maintenance program. Come on. You got to walk in that deliverance that God has given you. But now he says, rise up. And and we want to emphasize that this is not in our own power. This is not in our own power. Let me just say this. Anxiety, stress, depression. These are all products of a self-driven society. Yeah. Come on. Don't listen to these people, man. They're lying to you. They're trying to tell you you got a chemical imbalance. Well, go to Jesus and he'll set your chemicals right. Amen. He'll get your chemicals right. See, there's all this stuff and they don't want to show people how to really go free. They just want to have you in a situation where you're numbed for a little while. Jesus never did. Do you understand Jesus? Listen, people talk about depression and they say, man, I got all these mental issues. Do you realize that Jesus is the one that rolled up in on the man that had legions of devils in him? I'm going to come on, somebody. I'm talking about legion. This man was tearing. He was hurting himself. He was running around harming people, uh, running around with no clothes and all this stuff, just acting up. Jesus, as soon as Jesus showed up, them demons recognize it. Ooh, why are you here? Are you come to torment us before the time? Come on. How many know that depression medication wasn't working on them demons? Can I get an amen right there? Come on. That anxiety medication wasn't working on them demons? It wasn't doing nothing. Jesus cast out them demons and told them to go get in them swine. But then guess what? Then all the people ended up seeing that man clothed in his right mind. He didn't even go to counseling. Come on, he didn't go to counseling. He didn't go to nothing. This I'm talking about, you can look it up in your Bible. I didn't have time to go there. But that's the madman of Gadara. This man was crazy. And just at the presence of Jesus. Oh, but how do we see, how do we deal with that in a church? We don't deal with it like that. We say, well, man, you seem crazy. You need to get some medication. I didn't hear people say that. They're talking about no deliverance, no casting out. You need to get a prescription, brother. No, if that's where you at right now, I, to, I already told you, I'm not against medication. I'm just against people depending on it. I say you need to depend on Jesus and you need to pray, Lord, I don't want to be taking this no more. I believe I can get a right mind from you. So I pray for my healing. Let me, matter of fact, let me lay hands on myself. Amen. See what I'm saying? Nobody can tell me this ain't real. God has healed people from cancer. God has healed people from all kinds of stuff. I'm talking about Stage four cancer. They've been on the, they've been, he didn't got them up off the deathbed. 
we've got to believe that he's able. Yes. Yes. We've got to understand and trust him that he's able. Yes. I mean, we're talking about King Jesus. Yes. All power is in his hands. And so now, I'll say this again, anxiety, stress. Think about it. You, you're stressed out, worried about it because you're depending on you. I mean, what's your kids when they're little? What they're stressing about when they're in the back seat? <laughs> Nothing. They don't know nothing about no gas prices. Come on, somebody. They don't know nothing about the car needing to repair. They don't know nothing. They just in there going somewhere. And most of them fall asleep. In the back seat, they just fall asleep. What happened to the anxiety and all? They don't get all that till they grow up. They get anxiety, stress, and all that when they grow up. And this world gets a hold of them. Amen. And so I want to emphasize that it is not your own power. Man, I, I just feel the anointing on this. Yes. And so what the world says is the world says, take medication. Jesus says, take my yoke. Amen. Oh, y'all, you see, you know. The world says, take medication. Jesus says, take my yoke and learn of me. Come on. Yes. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. We already covered it. Amen. 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 Now, every time I preach like this, I have to put an asterisk. I'm not against medication. I'm not. I'm, my job is to teach you the book. My job is to teach you the book. Amen. And there's a healing for you. Not a maintenance. Because they'll tell you you're going to have to take this for the rest of your life. Only thing I'm taking for the rest of my life is water, food, stuff like that. Yeah, but I ain't about to take no medication. You said what? When? This, is this a 10 day? Mm -mm. What you? What? 180? 180 day? Mm -mm. They give you the prescription and they're going to keep renewing it. And then when you don't show up, they're going to call. Oh, y'all ain't in here. See, you don't know how. They're going to call you. You about due for a refill. Yeah. <laughs> we need you to come on up in here. Yeah. Then if you get some boldness and mess around and get healed, your doctor going to get upset at you. Yes. Your doctor going to say, well, now you're going to have a stroke. You need to tell them you're going to have a stroke. You and your mama. You better back up off me. People let, let all these people prophesy this stuff on them. They just let, lay it on them. Jesus said, take my yoke. Learn of me. The world is all set up to just have you accept everything. Amen. You know, see, you don't, how many of y'all, now hopefully this is not you, but if you get your neighbor's mail in your mailbox, you shouldn't be opening in that mail. I'm just saying. Right. You know it ain't yours, right. and so you need to give it to your neighbor. Right. Some of y'all like, well, I'm going to put some tape on it and tape it back. That ain't your mail. <laughs> it went to the wrong address. See, the devil is sending a lot of stuff out to the wrong address. You need to let them know oh, that's the wrong address. Come on, somebody. We don't receive that over here. Man, my family, we let that we let that be known right away. Oh, no, no. Ain't no COVID living at this address. It don't. It's wrong address. Come on. Y'all see, because I was going in on it when that thing first came out. I was going in on it so tough, I had people mad at me. I'm talking about people that was supposed to be my yoke fellows was mad at me. Because I was coming in like, ha, 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 ha. I was just decreeing it. It will not come in this church. It ain't going to come here. You will not get it. And, and people was like, they was going with me at first. But you know when people don't train? Come on. So you, you, you know what I'm saying? You can get in there for round one and you be like, yeah. I'm with you, pastor. Ha, ha, ha. Huh. And then you be talking about round two. <laughs> With your pastor. <laughs> hey, round by round three. <sighs> hey, then 
Round three, you talking about, get him, pastor. Come on, get him, pastor. You was with me on round one. By the time we got to round three, you, you cheering for me now. And that's how it was. I came out aggressive. My wife knows we got the oil. We poured it all around this parking lot. We was up in there decreeing and declaring. And for the first year that COVID came out, nobody in this church got it. Nobody. We didn't have one case. But the second year, people let, could we start getting into round three? Let the guards down. Get them, Pastor. Get them. <coughs> Get them. <coughs> Let me check my temperature. <coughs> Get them, Pastor. <coughs> and then they start coming out their mouth. This might be COVID. Uh, see, it would have never came out of their mouth in round one. It never came out. It never came out. Of and why? I'll tell you why. Because they thought it would kill them. See, when people learn more about stuff and they realize it ain't that dangerous and they ain't going to die, they give it permission. But when it's a death sentence, you will fight to the finish. You will fight and you will finish. You will, if it's a death sentence, you'll stand there, man, and you have to be knocked out. But when you realize it ain't no death sentence, when you realize your cousin got it, when you realize your neighbor got it, when you start realizing everybody ain't dying, then all of a sudden you get a little symptom. <clears throat> this might be COVID. Mm -hmm. And that's what the devil did. Not to me. At my house, it was still banned. Come on, somebody. At my house, it was still banned. It, it was still unwelcomed. Amen. At my house, it was still Psalm 91 all day, every day. That's what it was. That's what it's been. It's still, listen, for the next thing that comes out, it's still Psalm 91. You see what I'm saying? I ain't putting no confidence in no vaccine or whatever they got. That can't help me. The blood of Jesus is the only thing that's going to keep me alive. I'm not going to stay alive because of what they said or some doctor or some new thing. It's the blood, the same blood that defeated Satan over 2000 years ago is the same blood that's been applied and is active and flowing in my life. Ain't nothing else going to help me but the blood. See what I'm saying? That's an attitude, though. See, I had it. I had the attitude before. People got. The sniffles. Oh, that pastor, I don't want to shake your hand because I don't want to get. You can't get me sick, man. Yeah. Give me a hug. Because yeah. what I got is going to get on you. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, man. Amen. I never did it. I never got all. Oh, you better wash your hands. You better. You should be washing them anyway. <laughs> See, some of y'all know these people, man. I used to go to the gym, this one gym. I'm glad I don't go there no more. But anyway, uh, you know, you see some guys come in there, man, and you just hear, you hear the, 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 the seat, the toilet seat come down, plant. You don't hear no paper, nothing. You don't hear nothing. And it's all business. And then you see him come out. I'm over there, you know, changing my clothes or something. You see him come out. Um, they don't even go by the sink. They just go back to the gym. So I'm like, duly noted. You will not get a handshake from me. Amen. Uh, we'll be, uh, we're going to elbow pump on that. Right? There's some nasty folks out there. But what I'm saying, man, is we got to understand God's power is greater than us. If stuff is keeping us down, it's because we're still in us. Let that thing deal with Jesus. Yes. See, that's what happened with me when it was a COVID thing. I'm saying, I'll, I won't see what you do against the blood. Right. Now, that wasn't my fight. Right. So you're going you're gonna to take out Jesus? Let's go. Let's get it in. Let's see. Yeah. And guess what? It didn't land on us. Yeah. And we're still trucking, man. We're still moving. Yeah. All kind of stuff has changed, but I'm preaching the same thing. Yes. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so... The devil will always try to, you know, 2021 hit. People's guards were down. 
We had people trying to talk about, I think I got COVID at the church. Get out of here, man. You brought COVID over here. Go on back to the other church. You didn't get this from here. You're a lying devil. Go back to your other church. You know what I'm saying? I really had some people say some craziness like that. So you didn't get it here. So anyway, now this ain't, once again, I'm a pastor. I'm feeling down because I got COVID. Hey, it didn't take you out. I ain't mad at you. I'm, I'm expressing something from the word. So, so don't, don't be all offended, you know, and all that. This ain't about that. This is to tell you the strength of the book. Listen, if you don't have at least one person demonstrating in front of you, how are you going to know any of this is real? If you don't even know one person that's demonstrating this book in front of you, how are you going to know it's real? So I demonstrate this stuff. Amen. So I'm not running around here depressed. Doesn't mean I don't have things that come at me and cause concern, but I'm going to release it. I'm not going to let this carry me because if I'm carrying it, then now it's me. It's pride and pride comes before a fall. It takes a humble man to bow before his master and say, I cannot do this. I'm calling on your help. I'm calling on your strength. And then guess what? His strength will come on you. And his strength will give you the ability to rise. And so we don't have to be in that extreme mental, emotional depression and all that de de dejection. That should not be happening in the body of Christ. There should never be a Christian committing suicide. He's the God of life. He's the God of abundant life. Amen. And so he won't ridicule you or um, make you feel low. Any problem you got, take it to him. And he'll lift it and he'll cause you to walk in power, but he won't force you. And then you have to do this willingly. You have to willingly give it and go to Philippians now. Philippians um, chapter two. So once again, not your power. It's his power. Philippians 2, 13 and 15 and amplify. It says not in your own strength. You see that? It's not going to be you. It's not going to be uh, I'm strong because I went to Bible college. Don't nobody care. I'm strong because I've been saved for 25 years. No one cares. Amen. No one cares. People are always talking about, well, my uncle is uh, uh, Dr. Bishop Reverend Jenkins. Nobody cares about him. We don't know him. Amen. And so it's not in your own strength, for it is God who is all the while effectively, effectually at work in you. What is he doing? Energizing and creating in you the power and desire. Stop right there. I always challenge people, surrender yourself to God wholeheartedly and he will give you the energy. He'll give you the desire. He'll give you the passion to do the things that are pleasing to him. It'll be God through the power of the Holy Ghost that'll have you wanting to come to church. Come on. He'll have you thinking about Sunday service on Saturday. It is the power of the Holy Ghost. He will energize you. It will not matter how much sleep you got. You will get up with a pep in your step because it is the Holy Ghost on the inside of you energizing you and strengthening you and giving you the power and the desire. You know, things change when you got the desire for it. Think about that. When you got a desire. You got the power to do it, but you desire. You're like, man, I know some things changed in my life when I was young in my walk with God. And I had this one friend and he was new in the Lord. But man, we just had to. Back then, I drove school buses. We had to get up at like 4 a.m. But there was this Bible study on Thursday nights. And he would hit me. You going? We was just all, you know, newly saved. Yeah. But we had a desire. We did not care about sleep. Because we just was so excited about the word. And so we was just like, yeah, I'm going. You going? And there was a drive. Now, it's one thing when somebody says, they're trying to make you do it. But when you got a desire, if you got a desire, you'll fight through. You'll fight through fatigue. You'll fight through all kinds of things because you desire it. See? And 
So he is the one that gives us the power and the desire both to will and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. Yeah. Next verse. Do all things. Now, how can I do this? Because he gave me the power. Do all things without grumbling. You know what that means? Complaining. See, people that complain about everything, they're in the power of themselves. And you're complaining about traffic. You're complaining about your co-workers. You're complaining about everything. Well, it's you. You're doing it in the power of yourself. But he says, do all things without grumbling. And look, y'all look, see this? Some people have a Ph.D. in fault finding. They got a doctorate in fault finding. They know how to blame somebody for everything. God doesn't want us doing that. Do all things without grumbling and fault finding and complaining. And then it goes against God. And questioning and doubting among yourselves. Sometimes you got to tell. Oh, man, y'all ready for this? Y'all OK with this? You might need to tell your spouse. You, we, you need to stop asking so many questions. You're like, Pastor, you're trying to get me in trouble. Now, this is talking about God because he if it's we pray and we're doing something in faith and God's going to give you some direction. And then maybe your spouse is like, well, I don't know. I don't know if that's what. Are you sure? Well, if it's God, then just hey, you're going to have to stop asking so many questions. <laughs> this is what y'all in here with me, yeah. because this is what God will tell me. Yes. He ain't going to give me. He'll tell me something. And then he ain't going to let me come back and say, no, you sure, Lord, because can you? No, -uh. he'll tell me. Stop asking so many questions. Uh -huh. Amen. And so this is really sometimes, you know, if you're married and you got your house in order, this will be pressuring to the men. Because sometimes men like to say things that bring comfort. Don't worry about the comfort. Worry about the obedience. Yes. And if you're in position and you're doing what you're supposed to do as the man of the house, then now you say this is what the Lord said we're going to do. So this is what we're going to do. Well, are you sure? No, no. Stop asking all these questions. <laughs> and nobody got time for that. Y'all think I said that because my wife went to the bathroom. <laughs> oh, this is recorded. <laughs> oh, this is recorded. But if it's God, we just follow him. And we don't ask him questions. Don't you think Joshua would ask some questions for God? Like, wait, wait, wait. Lord, you said walk around Jericho. First of all, do you know how long that takes? And then you said seven days in a row. Wait, Lord. I probably misheard you in these instructions because it seemed like you said on the seventh day, do it seven times. That's probably not accurate, right? See what I'm saying? But you can't ask no questions. You just got to do it. You got to do what God said. And if you do what God said, you're going to get God's results. Amen. You're going to get God's results. And he says, so now do all this stuff without all these questions and complaining. The reason is, verse 15, that you may show yourselves to be blameless. How many of y'all want to be blameless? Yes. I'm talking about in the eyes of God. That you may show yourselves to be blameless and guileless, innocent and uncontaminated children of God without blemish, faultless, unrebukable in the midst of a crooked and wicked generation, spiritually perverted and perverse. That's where we live in America today, among whom you are seen as bright lights, stars or beacons shining out clearly in the dark world. And now we can do this because it's not us. See? It is coming, though, this world is so corrupt, it can make you mad. Y'all in here with me? It can make you mad, you know, to where you want to confront some people. So we heard this on our, uh, in our conference. One of the pastors was saying how, you know, it's so important for, like, Christians to get on the school boards and stuff like that because he was saying in San Diego County that they have a lady and she calls herself. Now, this is ridiculous. I, this is the kind of stuff where you say, oh, Lord, 
I'm glad I'm saved, but come on, man. Somebody need to do something about this. She calls herself Paula the penis. Okay, so right? That already don't make sense, right? So she dresses up in a penis costume. Y'all think I'm making this up. And she goes into the classroom. Wait, wait, wait. And the San Diego City Schools called her in. Invite. She didn't come and ask, can I do it? She was requested. And so she comes in, a woman dressed in a penis costume to teach little kids. Now they're getting them when they're like six, five and six, and to teach them some sex education. Amen. Now, we can't just keep on just letting this stuff happen. Act like the devil ain't really stepping up his game. Now, that does, you know, when you hear some stuff like that, it makes you, you're like, wait, hold on, man. What? What school? <laughs> what school? Wait, man, what's she trying to get her schedule? <laughs> but that just lets you know that is what this world is doing. So then now the question is, what are we doing? It's not going to be the power that we have within ourselves that's going to be able to change these things. It's going to be the power of God flowing through us. And so we have to understand it's not my own strength because my own ability is going to probably have me going the wrong way. But if I can get a hold of God and understand that it's his power that is needed so that now I know what to do, even how to pray. Because how many know, even in a prayer situation like that, we need to take the frustration that we might have towards a person and then uh, let God put in us compassion for the children. So now you're praying from a compassionate place for the sake of those children and not out of anger, anger towards this person. Amen. Well, why am I sharing that? It's because it shows you these things are too big for us. There's more going on that you don't even know. But if we can surrender, submit ourselves under the mighty hand of God, then now we would get these greater victories. Now, 2 Corinthians um, 12, 9. This is what I want to emphasize before we close. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength. Look at your name and say, that's the Lord's strength. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. That's all I want you to get out of that verse. His strength is made perfect in weakness. And so remember, all that anxiety, stress, depression, all that, that comes from, that's the products of a self-driven society. We're not self-driven. We sacrifice ourselves. And we let God have his way and do whatever he wants us to do or whatever he wants to do through us. And so kingdom living, which is how we want to live, when you submit to the kingdom, you will live better. But kingdom living is not self-driven, but spirit-driven. And so it's the Holy Spirit that starts to instruct you. But remember, it's going to take sacrifice. How many of y'all ever had a problem with pride? Oh, and we got one honest brother up in here too. Okay, everybody else lying. Lord, forgive them. Don't, don't, ju don't judge them today. Every single person has a problem with that or has had a problem. You have to deal with that from time to time. And so the way you deal with it is you humble yourself. You understand that God is greater than me. His power, like John said, I must decrease. He must increase. Well, his strength is made perfect in my weakness. But if I don't come to the place where I'm weak, then now his strength can, make, can be made perfect. And so his strength is made perfect in our weakness. And then this is why we we'll understand the power. When we are spirit led, the glory of God rests on us. And the weights of this world can no longer hold us down. Yes. See, somebody who's held down by their situation is still dealing with pride issues. But somebody who can rise above, even in the midst of adversity, come on somebody, even in the midst of things going all wrong, somebody that can rise above and still give God a praise, that's somebody who is operating in the power of God. That is somebody who has humbled themselves and now God is lifting them up. And now you start to get power 
to deal with everything you need to deal with. As we close Luke 2, 42, Jesus said, Father, if, it's your, if it be willing, if it be in your will, please remove this cup from me. Now think about this. If it was tough enough for Jesus to ask God to remove it, it must have been serious. There are a lot of things that we might ask God to just take away. Lord, just remove this obstacle, remove this whatever. But he might not take it away, but he'll give you the power to conquer it. Amen. He'll give you the power to go ahead and obey God. And so Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And so what he did in this simple prayer is he exchanged weakness for strength. Come on, somebody. He exchanged weakness for strength. And if you understand this, you got to lay down before you can rise up. And so you got to be willing to exchange your weakness, which the devil will try to deceive you. And he will always try to make you think you're stronger than you are. Because if you're strong enough, you can handle this. You can handle it on your own. But if you're weak, you will cry out, Abba, Father. Come on, somebody. You'll cry out quick, Abba, Father. I'm going to need your help. I'm going to need you to move. But I'm not going to allow pride and all these things. See, this is the key to living better. Living better is dying to self. Getting out the way. Letting the power of God take over you. Amen. And then let God lift you up. But it will be his strength and not your own. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for meeting us here this morning. We thank you that you've given us an opportunity to pray, to seek your face. Lord, you know us. You know everything about us. You know our rising up and our sitting down. And so we just humbly present ourselves to you right now. I'm praying for you right now. Maybe you're uh, at home, you're watching this. You don't know Jesus as Lord. Everything starts with you saying, here I am. Take me. Do with me as you please. That's what this is about. Come to the end of yourself. Jesus is standing at the door. That's the door of your heart and he's knocking. If anyone would open, he'd come in and dine with you. Your life will get better, but you got to let him in. Now let's pray this prayer. Let's say it together so anyone who hears this message will know how to receive Jesus as Lord. Repeat after me. Jesus, please forgive me for all of my sins. I commit my life into your hands. This day, I am saved. Do with me as you please and fill me with the power of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap right there. Amen. Praise God.